Hello, and welcome to With the First Link, the podcast that hopes to make our future as bright and as just as the one that we see in Star Trek The Next Generation. And we think that one way to do that is to recap and discuss the entire series, one episode at a time, doing our best to look at it all through an anti-oppression, pro-diversity, anti-racist lens. I'm Matthew Simone. And I'm Ruthie Cowper samoshi and today we will be talking about A Matter of Honor. This episode was written by Wanda M. Haight, Gregory Amos, and Burton Armis, and directed by Rob Bowman. It first aired on February 4th, 1989. For today's check-in, let's talk about feeling out of place. Ruthie. Matthew. Have you ever felt out of place? I have. I felt out of place in the opening yeah, of this podcast. me too. Podcast. I felt very out of place just now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but so that was, that was a good idea to swap spots yeah. since that's what this episode's about. Yeah, exchange, you know. Exchange. <laughs> uh, I have felt out of place. I feel out of place a lot. And I think some of that is like a personality thing. And... Oh, wait, sorry. In what way? I, th- I think that... <laughs> I think I have a personality that I think in some ways I need to feel out of place. I don't like oh. feeling super mainstream, although there is there is discomfort that comes with feeling out of place. So feeling like a bit edgy? Yeah. I When I was in high school. A rebel? The, rebel. Yeah. Class. When I was in high school, there was... <laughs> There was this ad campaign by Lifesavers that assigned each Lifesaver like a different personality. And (laughs) it's probably probably totally based in science. So it's it's, completely valid. No, it's super scientific. Uh, (laughs) Lifesavers each have their own personality. And the one for the green Lifesaver was uh, Lime doesn't fit in and that's the way he likes it. And I had a friend who told me that I was like that. I was like the green Lime Lime Lifesaver. Yeah. Line yeah. doesn't fit in. That's the way he likes it. So uh, I think I do kind of resist fitting in entirely, but I also feel discomfort with feeling out of place. It's a very strange place to be. I totally understand that. Yeah. Do you think that's a, is that a quality of introversion? Do you think? Oh, I don't know. I think sometimes it is because sometimes I'll see, uh, especially over the pandemic, I saw a lot of introversion type memes where it's like i miss everybody but i also don't want to see any of you <laughs> oh <laughs> kind yes, of thing, you know, yes. it's like um because I'm, I'm enjoying my little hidey space uh in the meantime so it's like i think because i do a lot of public presentation people assume that i'm probably more extroverted than i actually am yeah and so I, i've had to explain to people when i meet them or as we get to know each other they're like why you're so distant i'm like it's just it's kind of how i am yeah uh even though i sort of have a more you know public presentee personality because that's what i have to do but outside of that it's like i still want to be isolated but then i still feel lonely (laughs) it's kind of the paradox of introversion yeah it is a paradox you have done a couple of different exchange programs too right yeah it's so I've lived abroad twice. Part One of them was an actual exchange exchange. It was through the Rotary Club. And so I think Rotary is quite is pretty prolific around the world. For those of you who don't know it, it's it's kind of, I guess I'm breaking it down simply. It's basically a club of very wealthy people. <laughs> and they, they meet up in groups around the world, but then try to decide what, what they can do with their wealth to try to help their local communities. And I, my understanding is that the club, I used to know more about them in the past and I've forgotten to think with now, but my understanding is that Rotary was quite essential in the funding of polio vaccines around the world and basically oh. like was fundamental in the quashing of polio. Uh, so that's like one thing to their credit. The other thing that, that the Rotary clubs do is exchanges between their clubs for youth. So I was one of the youth that applied for that kind of program and I lived in Europe for a year in 1998 to 1999. And yeah, when I, I mean, I, parts of European society are that different from North America, but I was still in a place that, that where I didn't speak the language and I'd done like a few Spanish lessons before I'd gone, but that was about it. Um, but I will say is that that year abroad was quite profound for me understanding just how important some things in my life were and how unimportant some other things were. You have this process of like refining. One of those was Star Trek. Like, I missed Star Trek a whole bunch when I was overseas. No one watched Star Trek. They didn't have Star Trek over there? It was, yeah, it was big in Germany, uh, but it wasn't in Spain. No one in Spain really knew anything about Star Trek, and I really missed Star Trek. And my my mom, 
because uh, this is in the era pre-streaming, you know, yeah. uh, by quite a bit. My mom, like, would pack up care packs and sometimes mail me VHS tapes oh. with recordings of Star Trek episodes. That's nice. So two episodes in particular that I'm quite fond of, the uh, one in Voyager called Drone. I think it's in the second episode of the season five. And then another one called Night, which is I think the first season, the first episode of season five of Voyager were on those tapes. So I, I always remember them as being episodes that my mom had sent me. That's nice. And then the the other was I lived for one year in, in Africa. So uh, split between Uganda and Sierra Leone. Uh, so three months in Uganda and nine months in Sierra Leone and certainly out of place there. Yeah. But as you said, because we were talking about uh, this a little bit before the show, th- even though you might be out of place, it doesn't mean you're out of power. Yes. Yes. And I certainly felt with no influence or power in Spain, but even though I was m- much or much more a minority walking around in uh, Sierra Leone, I was still much very aware of the power I carried as a white foreign aid worker. Right. And that actually became very important to how we ended up founding the organization Esther's Echo that I run um, with uh, several other people, uh, which supports a woman that I met in Sierra Leone named Esther, uh, who runs her own school. Because I was like, it doesn't make any sense that I carry this much power. We should be giving that power or any kind of resources to local leadership yeah. in these places. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, it, like I was a twenty what three year old white foreign aid worker and still carried the amount of power that I did as a lone person in Sierra Leone, right? And that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I so the one thing that I did that was, I guess, sort of similar to an exchange is when I was in teachers college, uh, we had to do two like practicum placements, which were in schools in I was in Toronto so it was in Toronto and then we had to do a third placement that they called an internship and we could kind of do whatever we wanted with that as long as it somehow connected to education and I went with a a group of of other uh, teachers college students I went to Ecuador and okay it was I mean it was (laughs) way less than like you were you were away for a year I think both times I was away for about a month I lived with an indigenous family and the the, you know my my fellow teacher candidates they called us uh we we all lived with uh indigenous families and I had a really nice time I think that looking back I don't know that I would do that again because there really was still this power dynamic I was helping out in a daycare, but I, I honestly don't know that I was actually helpful. Like it, it right. seemed like it was mostly for my benefit and I didn't, right. I didn't know necessarily going into it that that's what it would be. But upon reflection, like what did I think I was going to have to offer? Like I had trained to be a high school teacher and now I was working in this daycare with three-year-olds. Which it was a lot of fun, but yeah, but it was yeah. I felt yeah, yeah. I felt similarly being overseas because it was like I am here. Like, what are my qualifications to be doing this? Right? Is it simply because I'm a white foreign aid worker? Yes. Is that yes. why I'm here? Right. So yeah. I feel like yeah, the idea of feeling out of place, it can be very uncomfortable. But for the two of us to talk about feeling out of place. No matter how uncomfortable we might feel, we're not in, we're not really in danger. We're not unsafe. And that feeling of out of place, which can for us be like an opportunity for growth for other people who don't have the same privileges that we have can actually be like a very uh, precarious position. Yeah, that that is, that is totally true. I, I try to express my both through the fandom of Star Trek or my my fandom and connection to Star Trek, but also the work I try to do in the world is focused through that lens because I as an individual being who I am, straight white male in our society, can still often feel lonely and out of place. Right. How much more so than must others when there literally is no place at all 
or when the society ex- actively excludes you. I mean, our society is already lonely when it doesn't, it's not actively targeting me for marginalization and it's still lonely sometimes. Yes. Never mind a society that is actively targeting you for marginalization. And so I feel like that was, that Star Trek showed me that place is important and then being able to travel and change my places created that awareness where it's like I can be out of place but not necessarily out of power and that that is an important distinction to make when we're talking about um, marginalization and trying to empathize with yeah. marginalization because it's something I will never fully experience yep. but I know what I the only thing I can know is that it's worse than the things I have experienced right. so that must be really awful. Right. Yeah oh I will say I did have a one year uh, sort of uh, I don't know five or six years ago maybe more at this point I can't keep track of time. I took a year teaching in England and that I felt out of place in a lot of ways. But again, it was really, you know, I I was I was still white. I was still I was from one of the colonies, so to speak. And uh, you know, I was just like a wacky Canadian as opposed to like being in any kind of danger or marginalized at all it was just like right oh you say grocery store funny or <laughs> do you <laughs> uh, apparently they don't say it there i don't know what they call it they call it like the shops the shops right i'm going to go to the shops not i'm going to go shops. to the grocery store so I, re- I remember that when you went away for that year yeah yeah and then you were, you were thinking about maybe staying there to like work there permanently yeah i thought about it and uh the education system felt like even more colonial than the one here. And I was like, uh, nope, I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I got a friend of mine who I, I think at the time I was trying to get you two to connect and it didn't work out. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. That we emailed. They're basically working toward trying to decolonize the, the education system over there. But yeah. Yeah. All right. Woof. Out of place. Yeah. So let's get into the episode, Ruthie, talking about exchanges. Yeah. And. Commander Riker's exchange. So what goes on in this episode? In this episode, the Enterprise participates in an exchange program and Riker serves as first officer on a Klingon ship. (laughs) Actually, I just, uh, my friend Ed, who's a friend of the pod. Hello, Ed, friend of the pod. He and I watched the Star Trek The Motion Picture 4K director's release yesterday. The brand new version of the motion picture that just came out. And that's the movie that introduces that Klingon theme song. It's a great, it's a great theme song. We don't really it hear it in this one. Uh, I think right at the end. Oh, okay. It's there very briefly. It's a good, it's a good theme. Bum, bum, theme. Bum, 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 bum. So the Starship Enterprise arrives at Starbase 179, where they're picking up people. Who are we picking up? Yeah, they, Riker and Wesley sort of greet four people in uh, science uniforms. They're wearing the blue Three of them, it seems, are joining the crew, like they're replacing people. And then there's one Benzite who is here for an exchange program. And Wesley thinks that it's uh, Mordok from the episode Coming of Age. And he's like, Mordok, you can't have graduated from the Academy that fast. But it's actually uh, Ensign Mendon. And there's a really awkward moment when Wesley's like, you look exactly like Mordok. How do you tell each other apart? (laughs) But, okay, I want to say something about that. Okay, go ahead. Because they are played by the same actor, Yes, that's Yes, they are played by the same actor. And I was reading, like, that had to do with the fact that they had created, like, like, I think the the prosthetics for his face. And they didn't want to then have to create those prosthetics for someone else's (laughs) face. So they brought him back. Makes sense. But, like, there is a really problematic... I don't even know what to call it. But, like, it, it does happen that people especially like white people will get two different people who are maybe like they're of the same race, but they're both non-white. It will get them confused and be like, oh, I can't tell them apart. They look really similar and they don't look similar. Right. They're just like, they're both not white. And so it's just, it's a really insensitive thing that happens. Yeah, they're different from me. So they must be the same. Yeah, like like you, right. you're you clearly not paying attention to the actual differences in people's faces. But like, that's not what happened here because this guy actually is identical because it's right. the same person. And so I feel like that sort of dilutes the message a little bit. 
Yeah, I would say so as well. He, they say that in the end, he's like, I'm part of the same geo structure. Something like that, so yeah. So they don't say what that is, but I guess they're part of a similar, like, part of the same family. I don't know. It, it's not in their clear. Society. Yeah. No. Yeah, it isn't. But the other thing I was wondering was, so Mordok was the first Benzite to join the Academy. I So I've heard that this is like a continuity error because Mendon shouldn't then be an officer if he if Mordok was the first ever Benzite to join Starfleet. Right, which is to Wesley's point. He shouldn't yeah. have graduated that fast. Yeah, right? but I am wondering, even though he's wearing a Starfleet uniform, if he's part of an exchange and throughout the, the episode, like he talks about some sort of cultural differences that he experiences, is he even part of Starfleet or is he uh, an officer in like the Benzite fleet? Right. And I was going to ask you that actually, because he keeps talking about going back to his ship. Yeah. In which case, has he just been given the rank of Ensign? I think so. As an officer on the ship, maybe kind of like the way Riker will end up being given a rank there. Yeah. But, but Riker actually is second in command of the Enterprise, so that kind of makes sense. So we don't know if, I guess, Mendon maybe is the equivalent of an Ensign on his Benzite ship. That was how I interpreted it. Right. So. Yeah, that might make sense. But in, in but in that case, and it's really weird for Wesley to say, you couldn't have graduated from the Academy that fast when, like, he hasn't even been to the Academy and Wesley knows that this guy is here as an exchange officer. So. Yeah, and he's a star- He's in a Starfleet uniform as well. Well, that's so, true, too. Yeah, so there's, everything's confusing about Mendon. <laughs> yes. So we can, we can empathize with Wesley here a little bit. A little bit. Riker tells Mendon that he will have a briefing and indoctrination session in 15 minutes. Yeah, you know what we call that now? Or, uh, Ruthie, orientation? We call it on, onboarding. Onboarding, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Indoctrination. What a word. That is that is a word. Yeah. Yeah, it, it felt a bit like, oh, okay. But uh, yeah, like now we just call it, we call it nice things like onboarding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mendon says that he's very happy to be assigned to the Enterprise. He's kind of like ingratiating himself upon... Yes. Right. Like he's super like eager and stuff. So he's like, he knows that he can be of great yeah. help. And Riker's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> go with Wesley here and he'll show you around. And then kind of like gives O'Brien this look and O'Brien kind of like rolls his yeah. eyes. <laughs> yeah. So then Picard calls for Riker to report to the phaser range. And they just like, they're just kind of shooting around together. And they're doing, it's a great, like, exposition, Ron and Don talk, because Picard's like, so, Riker, what do you think about the officer exchange program initiated by Starfleet Command? <laughs> yeah, they're just shooting these random colored dots, and Picard's got this funny stance where he's got sort of, like, one hand out. He's, like, both his arms are out parallel. Yeah, they're both standing with, well, and they're like doing, like, a, they're standing with their backs to each other. I feel like it's a practice that they're they're covering each other's backs, almost. Oh, I did, yeah, and they're competing as well, right? So they're trying to shoot like yeah. the colored dots. They're they're both standing on a color, like one of them yeah. is on blue and one's on yellow, yeah. and they have to shoot like the blue and yellow dots as they come up. Yeah, and they and you're right, they just get this chance to then talk about what's happening in the episode and tell us what's happening in the tell episode. us what's going on. So Picard says that someone had suggested an officer from the Enterprise should participate in the exchange program on a nearby Klingon vessel. Yeah. And Riker, like, he volunteers for it. And it's kind of funny because Picard's like, pardon me, what did you say? And he's like, no, I, I said I'll, I'll volunteer for it. And the reason he wants... Do you think that he was, that was the point of this was to get Riker to do it? I think he wanted Riker to oh, go on this exchange. Oh, okay. That's, that was the impression I got. I, I don't, like, I don't disagree. I didn't, I didn't take that from it, but I, that makes sense. I could see that for sure. Yeah, trying to push his push his first officer and Riker. So Riker volunteers because he why what's he why is he here about this? Well, he's he he likes the fact that no one's done it before. He likes to no be the first to do things, and I, that makes sense. Yeah, that like Picard would phrase it that way. Be like, yeah, no one's ever done it before. Worf's the first one here. We've benefited from having him here. You know, they could benefit from having you there. We could benefit from you having been there. So, yeah. Right, and we're trying to we're trying to integrate more with the Klingons now, right? Yes. We have a Klingon on the Enterprise, so that makes sense. Yeah, and then the conversation just fades out. Yeah, one we of just those go to the fades. intro. It's another one of those awkward, uh, yeah, Fade awkward to rolls into an intro. <laughs> Fade to black intro. Yeah. So the, we start off with the captain's log. The ship is on its way to rendezvous with the Klingon vessel, pa, to drop Riker off. So in the corridor, if you're going to be going on a Klingon ship, you probably want to talk to Worf. Yes. So they're talking, <laughs> they're talking back and forth, and 
there it's explained that one of the duties of the Klingon first officer is to assassinate their captain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Riker's like, oh, that's not what I thought I would be signing up to do. No. And the idea Worf explains is that if the captain becomes weak and weak. unable to do the job, there's a lot of talk of weakening in this episode. Mm-hmm. So if the captain becomes weak and can't do the job, then they expect the first officer to, Worf puts it like, assist in, in the retirement. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, like your your second officer would do that for you and like everyone would, once you're not able to do the job, rather than, you know, being you know, not doing a poor job and being dishonorable, you get killed. You get killed off. Yeah, you're you're retired. Yes. And retired. yeah, and Riker points out that it's a different system, but Worf says, well, yeah, many things will, will be different. And like, that's, yeah, that's the point. But it's worked for many years. That's the thing. Worf says it's- It know, works for like the Klingons, for, yeah. For centuries, essentially, the system. Yeah. Back on the bridge, Mendon watches what various people are doing. <laughs> He's like basically just going around telling people how to do their jobs, which is probably annoying for everyone there because this guy's just shown up. And then he starts talking to the tactical officer, yeah. who's not Worf because Worf's in the hallway talking yeah. with Riker, and tells him how there's a way to improve shield response time and then apologizes for interrupting the officer. But I am correct in what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he. it's funny. I feel sort of... I, I can feel some compassion for Mendon because he clearly comes from a different way of doing things and maybe what he's doing right now would actually be appropriate on his ship. And I also, like, I have been in situations where someone new comes and basically is like, well, here's everything wrong with what you're doing. And that person is usually missing context as to why those things like when I when I start like if I start a job in a new school or start like working with a new organization or whatever and I think this is kind of how my personality is I tend to do a lot of observing first to kind of see how things work also like get a sense of the social kind of norms and dynamics before I start saying like you know it would be way better if you blah 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 Mendon's not doing any of that he's not waiting to see like how does this how does this work why is this ship doing things the way they the way they do things but I also think it's important to note that he doesn't have any structural power so he's being annoying but he's not like that's it it's just annoying he's not like a new boss who's gonna turn everything Upside down. Upside down, because this is how we did it at the last place that I super. Right. Her. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's just he's just annoying. Yeah, it is annoying. I this this was something I tried to be cognizant of when I was in Sierra Leone because I was working with local community organizations and many of them were actually open or expected me to provide information as to how their operations would run better. Right. Where I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm an undergrad student. <laughs> I should, yeah, I should be taking notes from what all of you are doing. Yes. And that's kind of like, we're going to see this in a bit, but that's kind of the, the take that Riker's having, where Riker's like, well, I got to try to learn as much as I can before I go yeah. so that I have some of this context. Yeah. Anyways, before that, though, Mendon walks up to Wesley, who's at the at the con, <laughs> and uh, tells Wesley that, they're, that the input sampling is fantastic, superb, but he could make the helm readout a lot better. And Wesley's like, we haven't had any problems with it until now. <laughs> Yeah, and he's like, well, I don't know in practice, but in my theory, it would be more than a marginal improvement. So, like, he really doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to say this to to you, Ruthie, from time to time. I'll be like, well, you know what? I think this would be more than a marginal improvement if we did this. If you could make sure to say that about aspects of my life that you have, like, zero knowledge or experience (laughs) of, I would really appreciate it. (laughs) Sounds good. Uh, Mendon wants to know if, if Picard is open to these astute observations. And says that soon we'll get to things running perfectly. Yeah. And like Wesley being Wesley and like (laughs) eager and honest is like, well, I don't, I've never known Picard to never listen to any of his officers, (laughs) which is a very kind response. He is. Wesley's like working on being quite tactful here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He's doing a good job. Yeah. In 10 Forward, we see Riker is sitting in front of this feast of new foods. Yeah. He's eating Pippius Claw, Heart of Targ, and he says Gog. But it's pronounced gah. 
I believe. Gah, yeah, as we find out. But if there's one Klingon delicacy we become very familiar with, it's gah, gah. which is serpent worms. Serpent worms. So Pulaski makes some, I think, quite rude comments about the food. I think, like, you know, you can feel however you want about food, but you don't have to say it. And especially when someone is, like, putting that food in their mouth to say, like, ugh, that's gross, is, like... I think that's really unkind. Yeah, and the food, as you were saying, is is actually based on real cuisine. Yeah, it's it's really I think it's problematic the way they they included a lot of I think Japanese food to represent the Klingon food. So that is also a very like oh well you know like like exoticizing and sort of dehumanizing. Right, it's exotic to whom exactly because yeah. then. You're you're really kind of betraying in that sense who you believe your audience is yes, for a show. Very much. Very much. Yeah. It's very white centered and, and focused. So Riker makes a comment about like weakening. And I didn't really get what they were talking about, but Pulaski says usually what kills them or usually what kills us kills them. I think I feel like that was almost like fighting advice. Like you don't need to worry about I don't I don't even know. Like basically their physio- f- physiology isn't much different. I don't know. Right. I'm not quite sure what she was talking about. Uh then Picard enters and also makes some comments about the food, but he does take a drink that Riker offers him. <laughs> and he does he goes to sip it but kind of like puts yeah. it down on the table. Yeah. He's like, mm, All right, uh, thanks. Nope. No thanks. Yeah. yeah, he's excited for Riker to have this opportunity to learn more about the Klingons. Yes, and I appreciated that about Riker. Riker is, he is diving into this role, like, wholeheartedly. He's excited to go spend time with the Klingons. He's talking to Worf. He's sampling the food. I I guess we have records of their food, enough that it can be replicated, I, guess, I would assume. Yeah. And at this point, also, one of the servers comes over with more food. More food. And they're just and piling food on the yeah, table. Yeah, and I think that... The food sound, like the, what do you call it? Like the foley of like Riker chewing yep. and like the food, like when he picks up the food, the like sort of squelching noises, I think it's louder than usual. I I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> and I'll say why. As I was watching this episode and watching him like crunch down on all these like delicacies, I got hungry and I made myself food. <laughs> Just by from watching him eat and hearing the crunch, I'm like, oh, I want some like crunchy. I realized I had some like breaded chicken. Oh, nice. And it was, I was like, what can I eat that's going to crunch like Riker is crunching right now? Yeah. Anyways, so yeah, I think they definitely, I think you're totally right. Yeah. They upped the sound <laughs> really on the crunching upped, yeah. and munching of his food. Yeah. <laughs> In the corridor outside, uh, Riker's heading to the transporter room to beam board the Pach. And while he's on the way there, Worf gives Riker this little like cylindrical tube thing. Yes, it's it's Chekhov's emergency transponder. Not Chekhov like Pavel Chekhov in uh in the original series, but Chekhov like Chekhov's gun. Oh. You know, well the idea of like, you know, if you introduce something early on, it's going to be important later in the episode. So Oh, so it's a, this is a writing device. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the idea of Chekhov's gun is like if you have a gun in the first act, then the gun better go off in the last act and if you have a gun go off in the last act you should have it introduced in the first act so i still like the idea better that this device was actually invented by pavel Chekhov. it could could have been also maybe <laughs> both of those it's yeah it <laughs> could be that but yeah so he he hands it to to Riker to basically say you know just it's a security measure just to ensure that you are able to safely return to the ship right back on the bridge the pa approaches and captain cargon who's the captain of the ship, tells Picard to beam Riker aboard immediately. And Picard's like, you're getting a very fine officer. And Karkin's like, I'll be the decider of that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Menden comments that they are not very hospitable. And Worf is like, that's not for you to comment on. And he tells him to observe his station, which I feel is like a double meaning, like both like, do the work you're supposed to do and also like don't like your station as in how high you are in the chain of command. Yes, I think that's very like, know true. your place and also do your work. And then Mendon apologizes for offending Worf and Worf's like, you haven't yet. <laughs> if there was any duo that would be more mismatched in this situation, it would be <laughs> Mendon and Worf. 
so it's their true. their dynamic is is really fun. <laughs> it's true. So as the Klingon ship is flying away with Riker aboard now, Mendon notices something on the Klingon ship. It's kind of on the neck of the bird of prey. Yeah. So bird of prey has like these kind of sweeping wings in the back and then this kind of extended forward part like a neck and then the bridge is on the end of it. It's almost like a bird with a very long neck. Yes. And Mendon notices that there's something kind of on the throat of that neck closer toward the bridge and that he's doing he's scanning it there's like this screen where you can see a crosshair over that section of the ship and on the screen it says that there's some subatomic bacterial colony but it keeps flashing inconclusive and he doesn't tell anyone about it no you just see him like working away just you working away so picard tells wesley to uh resume course and then he kind of hands the bridge over to data and as he is about to leave the bridge mendon introduces himself and says he's pleased to be aboard the enterprise and then informs picard that he has some suggestions for procedural changes to speed things up and picard is very i think like kind here he doesn't shoot him down but he says okay if you want to do that you follow the chain of command you tell Worf about your observations. And Mendon kind of apologizes and said, I just wanted to impress upon you. And Picard again cuts him off, says, no, you don't need to apologize. I We should have made this more clear during your indoctrination session. But yeah, the, you're, you're not, I'm not going to just, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you basically follow the chain of command. And then Worf is like, you can impress me. <laughs> <laughs> and to Mendon, yeah. you may impress me. <laughs> it is really like they are very mismatched. And I don't I don't know that oh, I would yeah. say like, yeah, let's take this this new exchange officer and have them report to like one of Morph. the least like <laughs> open and friendly officers. We have. Uh, yeah. Like I love Worf. I say this with a lot of love for Worf, but no, he is not the welcoming committee. <laughs> Yeah, if you're going to go on an exchange program to learn about the Federation, you'd have a very specific and unique experience if the officer you're reporting to is Worf. I don't know if that would be, like, really generally your experience throughout the rest of the Federation on a starship. But yeah. anyways, poor Mendon. Maybe that's the person he has the most to learn from. Maybe. You know, in this particular maybe. situation, given his his peculiarities around how he knows things work on a ship. Yeah. We go above the pa, and I... Love the interior design on Klingon ships. Oh, it's like dark. Yeah, there's like red lights. It's always sort of like foggy. It always kind of looks like you're in like a submarine. Everything's very metal. It does. I always feel like things aren't quite working properly and there's like smoke and fog coming out of machinery and stuff yeah, like it's that. Yeah, everything's just kind of falling apart. And it's completely the opposite in every way to the Enterprise. Yeah. You know, that's cushy and bright. And has plants and stuff like <laughs> there's none of that on this ship. Yeah. And you know, and even before we kind of missed a bit there, but even before Riker goes, when he's in the transporter room, like O'Brien is surprised that Riker isn't afraid to go to this place. You know, and, and Riker's yeah. like, Should I be? And O'Brien's like, I would yeah. be. You know, this is gonna be really intimidating. So beams him on there and this as he's walking through the corridors, there's this Klingon officer who, who's walking behind him that's just kind of like staring at him. Yeah. <laughs> And he's like, is something wrong? Yeah. And and the Klingon officer says that he's never seen a human before. And Riker kind of gets sort of huffy. And this is where I feel like the power structure is really important. Because even though Riker is the only human on this ship, Riker is a member of Starfleet, which has a lot of power. Yeah. And he's also the commander on this ship. Yeah. He's the first he officer there. on the ship. He is also in his day job first officer of the flagship of the federation the united federation of planets like he's got a lot yeah. of power if something were to happen to him those klingons would be in a lot of trouble that's not necessarily the same for someone like mendon right yeah exactly and so he yeah. but he does get huffy and he's like oh i'm just like any other starfleet officer and then he gets to the bridge and introduces himself as commander william Riker of the starship enterprise and captain cargon corrects him and says, no, you are a first officer of the Pach. Cargan wants to know where his Riker's loyalties lie. And this is like a big thing for them because he's like, well, are they in conflict? Like, are you are you basically saying that, like, you wouldn't serve our vessel because we're a warship. And if we, we're currently on a mission of peace, but if we do go to war, 
are you really going to be like willing to die with us as crew member? And he's like, well, no, I, I have sworn an oath to the ship and I'll obey your orders. And if we die together in battle, then I'm going to die with you. Yeah. And this is where we get Clag. So Clag is my favorite. Yeah, I like Clag. He's great. So Clegg is pl- played by an actor named Brian Thompson. And Brian Thompson shows up in a whole bunch of Star Trek. Oh, yeah. As well as like a whole number of other movies and shows. Because he's got like a look about yeah. him, right? He's like, <laughs> it's kind of like foreboding. Um, he plays uh, another actually, Klingon later. And then also I think a Romulan, right? Yes. He plays a Romulan uh, in Enterprise. He plays another Klingon in, in TNG. He plays some other aliens as well in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Um, He's a, a vampire in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Like oh, he, He's all yeah. over the place. Yeah, so Brian Thompson is everywhere. He's in all kinds of stuff. He's like in the Terminator movie. He's like, he's everywhere. So Brian Thompson is everywhere. He's one of these character actors. Like he plays these sort of interesting roles. Uh, we've actually been thinking about bringing him in. We were talking about him bringing him in as a guest at ThunderCon in Thunder Bay. Oh, nice. Uh, he was one of the people that was up on the list. Anyways, so so Clagg kind of like says basically to Cargon. I don't believe him. He's lying. But he says it in Klingon. And Cargan says, like, well, say it in their language. Because basically he wants Riker to hear this challenge. So Clagg kind of walks over to Riker and, like, raises his chin. And he's like, I do not believe you. Yeah. And he growls at him, which will be important later. And then Riker beats the crap out of him. Yeah, because he, he looks at Cargon, the captain, and he's like, what do you think of this? And Cargon's like, I think this is your first command challenge, yeah. basically. So Riker has to decide what to do. So yeah, he like he hits Clag in the stomach, like, doubling him over, and then grabs him by the head and flips him on the ground. Yeah. And then picks him up and literally throws him into a console and it like explodes. Yeah, like sparks fly. Yeah. Literal, not like just because it's so exciting. <laughs> like actual sparks yeah. fly out of the wall. Actual sparks. And then he kind of, like, asks Clegg what he thinks now. And Clegg's like, I will follow your orders. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just looked up Brian Thompson as we were talking. And he actually plays two characters on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There you go. And there there are quite a few actors who play a few characters on both Star Trek and Buffy, which I like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think every those all those shows just exchange everybody. Like, every (laughs) especially once they run for so long. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, there it is a sort of, like, you know, Riker, Riker, this is not how Riker would behave on the Enterprise, but he, this is what is expected of him on Yeah, and he's, he's done his homework. Yeah. He knows that this is what, this is how you need to deal with this particular command challenge. Yeah. We're back on the Enterprise. Yeah, Worf now has picked up something on the Enterprise's hull. It's kind of funny, he calls it the exterior skin. Mm-hmm. But Mendon has also found it, and it's, uh, Data looks at it and says that it appears to be a rare form of subatomic bacteria that doubles itself every 15 minutes, and it's reacting with certain compounds that are present in the Enterprise's structure. And then Mendon says that the same substance is on the Pach as well. And there's a, I find this really funny. Like, Data is sitting in Riker's seat because he is currently second in command and he just turns all the way around like yeah it's kind of like, a, like what i you beg say? your pardon <laughs> i didn't even know that chair could swivel that I far know, around but it is I like a very it's like, like a oh, head man. turn but like even more so yeah it's kind of like a wtf what did you just yeah say? so mendon didn't inform anybody of finding that substance on the klingon ship yeah and when everyone's like well why why didn't you tell us at this? Yeah. And he's kind of like, well, I didn't hadn't completed my analysis yet. He's like, no Benzite would ever bring any information forward to a superior officer unless it had been fully analyzed yet. Yeah, and this to me is where I was like, okay, he's not he doesn't usually serve on a Starfleet ship because right. In like it's not just on the Enterprise that you you would inform. That's standard across Starfleet. Right? Yes. I mean, it is clearly like A cultural difference and Picard is very clear about what Mendon needs to do, but I think is also very reasonable that like, okay, this was a difference we didn't know we had, something we didn't know we should tell you. Now we're telling you, continue your analysis, use whatever resources are necessary, and Data's going to supervise you as you do that. 
Yeah, and if you discover anything out of the ordinary, tell us right away. Yes. And so after they've had like a dressing down of him, Worf still <laughs> needs to have his two cents here. So he like wanders up behind Mendon and then he's like, and then I will instruct you in Enterprise etiquette. Yeah, that felt a little much. <laughs> like he has just, like, I think Picard was working really hard not to, like, it's a bit of a dressing down, but I think Picard was trying not to, like, punish him. Right. He tells Mendon to continue the analysis. He's not like, you know... Worf is going to take over or Data is going to take over. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Worf probably feels a little dressed down himself in that Maybe. sense. Because this is the officer that he's supposed to be supervising and he's like acting completely improperly. So I think Worf needs to say like, hey, you're making me look bad. Yeah. Dude. So I'm gonna, you're going to be instructed in etiquette here. Yeah. And then on the path, we get Riker's sort of personal log that he is impressed with the abilities and the single-mindedness of the Klingons. And then we cut to him in the mess hall with a bunch of other officers, and they're all kind of sizing him up. And they point out that he's he's not eating very much, and they ask if he enjoys the food. And he does sort of impress them. He knows what the different things are called, and he is eating some of it. And then, uh, <laughs> so Clegg offers him some gach, and Riker's surprised because it's moving. Right. And Clagg is like, well, <laughs> to me it was like the two famous Klingon proverbs. The first is, revenge is a dish best served cold. And the second is, gach is a dish best served live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's and it's, So they still have it. They have it like moving around. I always wondered actually what those are like, like yeah. in real life because Jonathan Frakes like eats them. At least he puts them in his mouth. Yeah. I don't know if he actually swallows any of what that is. Now, I will say here is that in my travels, yeah. one way to really bind with a group of people or begin to show respect for a group of people was to eat food with them. Right. And to and to respect and honor the fact that they are feeding you and giving you their that they're the dishes that they are proud of or that are a part of their history and their culture. Yeah. And I know that Sometimes when I was traveling with with the various organizations and groups of traveling with, I, I sometimes did travel with people who would not eat the local food. Right. And it, it really created a barrier between you and others. And so there's one thing that I really appreciated about Riker and in this story is that he really does make a point of like sitting with them, eating with yes. them, knowing their food ahead of time. Because... As we see in Klingon culture as well, that actually is a big part of bonding. You don't get scenes like this in on the Enterprise of like big groups of people yeah. sitting around tables together, except during celebrations. But this is part of their day-to-day -day life. They eat together as a crew, and he is doing that with them. And I appreciated that about this this episode. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I did as well. And I thought that uh I thought that Riker was was really taking this seriously as this is mm -hmm. a, I really felt that he he did not he was aware that the Klingon vessel might not benefit much from having him that this yes. was a learning experience for him and while I think like you know my experience in Ecuador I think it's kind of problematic for you know someone like me to just kind of go to another country and be like I'm here to learn from you and take all of your knowledge and offer you nothing in return. Uh, yeah. I do think that it is at least important that Riker knows that that's what's happening. You know, it's not like like he's not being like Mendon and saying like, here's how we're going to do things better. Yeah, they'd probably just kill that him. Would, he would, he anyway. would definitely get beat up if that happened, yeah. <laughs> He'd get beat up, yeah. I think that's what happened. Yeah. Now, the conversation goes... Goes a little different. Yeah, here. it goes a little. I, I was wondering when I was watching this. I was like, I wonder. I would like to know what Ruthie, how Ruthie feels about this, because what happens is they kind of make a. Clang is kind of poking at Riker. It says, you know, if the food's too strong for you, maybe we could offer you something like easier to eat. And he's like, well, what? And he's like, perhaps one of the females could breastfeed you. And then everyone starts. Everyone starts laughing. Yeah, and he laughs along with them. He does, and I, you know, I can forgive that a little bit with he's he's trying to understand the social and command structure uh but it does turn very sort of locker room-esque like there's a part where the women that there are two women in this mess hall and they're 
both kind of looking at Riker and and someone <laughs> says like lips. <laughs> yeah someone's like oh they want to know how you would endure them and Riker's response is one or both and everyone just <laughs> kind of laughs about it and again like Riker is doing you know he's he's working to fit in I think what bothers me is not so much like any particular individual character's behavior but just the fact that like in writing a, a tough culture that's what it turns to like it turns to like sexualizing and and then also like infantilizing but also in a sort of sexual way of like oh if you can't eat our food you can be breastfed but meanwhile the people who would breastfeed you are also like looking you up and down like they want to have sex with you like it's just it's an unfortunate like shorthand for showing like toughness and machoism right yeah yeah because i one of the women even says like she's she's sitting beside him and she says well he's not very attractive but i will have yes him. <laughs> so yeah so i was like does it change the dynamic in the situation because in a lot like, usually in that locker room dynamic we're thinking just of a crowd of men right but the women here are I want to say participating, I yeah. guess, in the conversation with yeah. him. So does that make it, I mean, it doesn't, like you're saying, it's still a writing shorthand. Yeah. But it's maybe not as misogynist. I think it's. Then with their participation. I think I it's I'm trying to work better. that out of my brain. I think it's better. It's still not great because it kind of puts the, the kind of standard toughness is, you know, this idea of like, I can dominate someone sexually. Like. So right. that's still yes. not great, even though it's a little <laughs> bit uh, flipped or or mixed right. a bit. But but yeah, it's it's quite a scene for sure. It is quite a scene, yeah. And and Klingon culture, as we find out, is kind of a weird mix of misogyny and then not because they still consider women to be like warriors who come along with them in the journey and everything else. But then they're not allowed to have leadership positions, yeah. and so it's kind of weird yeah. to work all that through. Yeah. But anyways, as the crowd kind of clears out a little bit and it's just Clagg and the, the other officer who originally had brought Riker on right. board. And Clagg asks if Riker is a typical Federation officer. And he was like, I guess so. Why are you asking? And he says, well, Klingons, he's like, we're, we're surprised that you have a sense of humor yeah. because we didn't think that that's how humans were. Yeah. And Riker kind of feels the same way. He thinks that like he's kind of surprised that these Klingons have a sense of humor. He says, like, even Worf, who is the Klingon who I know best, doesn't laugh very much. No, but as we find out, Worf isn't maybe typical of other yeah. Klingons. So, yeah. Yeah, and then the other officer, I think the one whose name we don't know, says that, you know, I we're not that different. I have parents just like you do. And so that starts Riker to ask about the two officers' families. So... One of them says, I have a mother who is still alive and my father was killed in battle. And then Clagg tells Riker about his father, that his father was captured by Romulans and kept alive. And now he lives on the Klingon planet waiting to die of a natural illness and basically dishonored. He's weak, he's useless, and Clagg will not see him. Yeah, and Riker's surprised that he won't even go see his own father. And Clagg says that Klingons don't express their feelings the same way like humans do. And Riker's like, well, why not? And he's like, well, we would, he's like, we would not know how, we would not know why. <laughs> and then so Riker takes his fork, kind of with a big smile on his face, and he says, well, yesterday I did not know how to eat gach, and then kind of shovels into his mouth, yeah. and they all kind of smile. And I, for, yes, there are some, there's some problematic issues <laughs> with the scene, as we talked about. Yeah. But I, I actually, I really like where they get to with this, like, because it's showing that the Klingons are open to learning as well. And there's some heart in this in this part in terms of the exchange and them getting to know each other and, and building these bridges across their cultural differences. There is. And I also think we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, we talked about it in like the episode before with Klingons. I can't remember what that one's called. But like the other one where we meet those sort of renegade Klingons who wanted to blow up the Enterprise. Right, yeah, yeah. And we talked about the idea of like strength. And I think one of the things that Riker is communicating here without directly saying it is expressing your emotions and being vulnerable is a sign of strength. Just like me eating this food that was unfamiliar to me is also a sign of strength or is is, is going to make me stronger. That 
you yeah, can do that like too. It's bravery and, and it's it's yeah. it's not it's not weakness to to do something that you don't know how to do. Yeah. So I, I yeah, do like that. For sure. On the Enterprise Bridge, Mendon says that the organisms feed on some of the compounds that make up the hull. So they're hungry and they're like eating the Enterprise. And the PA is even more susceptible because the compounds that this bacteria eats are in greater abundance in the hull of the PA. Yeah. So data says there there should be a 12 centimeter opening in the PA's hull right now. And so and when Picard hears that, he's like, okay, oh, this is a big problem. We have to go, go back to them. So he tells Worf to signal them. Yeah. They may not be aware of the danger. So now this is going to create a huge problem. We're about to see here how Mendon is going to create an interstellar war. Because <laughs> on the paw, we said Mendon may not have any power, but uh, on the paw, there is a hole in the hull. And Cargon wants to know what Riker makes of it. And Riker is like, well, maybe they're hit by a small meteor. And Cargon's like, no. Yeah. And he's like, okay, is it corrosion? He's like, it's not corrosion. And then so Riker is like, okay, well, what is it? And Clog. Clag says that it's a space organism eating the hull, and they don't have a way to repair it. And then in less than eight hours, the hull will be so compromised that the ship is basically going to fall apart. So Cargon is really suspicious because the only other vessel that they've been in contact with is the Enterprise. Yeah. And the Enterprise at one point directed an intense scanning beam at this specific area for two full oh, minutes. Mendon. And that was what Menton oh. was doing. And Riker's yes. like, I can't explain it. Like, that's, it's not a weapon. The Enterprise has no reason to try to destroy this ship, especially with me on board. But Cargon's not having it. And he wants to attack and destroy the Enterprise. Yeah, and I, I don't think that they stand a chance, but that's where Cargon is doing. No. So back on the Enterprise Bridge, Wesley approaches Mendon and he comments that he's made good progress. He's like, you made good progress. I laughed at these scenes being back to back because in one of them, they're like, Mendon's going to start a war. <laughs> and then in the next scene, Wesley's like, hey, you're doing a great job. Well, Mendon's good like, for learning yeah, and stuff. It's a, it's a nice, you just made a little mistake. It's no big deal. It is. It is kind of this nice sort of dramatic irony where like the Enterprise has, like no one on the Enterprise has any idea that this is happening on the no. Pach and that that they are like going to narrowly avert being in battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like bringing two entire societies to conflict yeah. for like the first time in a hundred years. Yeah. Um, but Mendon's down on himself for for making a mistake, for not learning and adapting fast enough. At least you know I think there's some growth for here. Sure. He realizes that he has to grow, yeah. and he's like, I can never recover from this failure. And I laughed to myself. I was like, Yeah, especially if you get killed. <laughs> uh, but anyways, Wesley says that Mendon just made an error and that he messed up on protocol a literal. And again, all this is very sweet when you don't put it in context of the fact that the Klingons are now hunting down the Enterprise to kill everybody. Yeah. But he asks, he's like, why are you being so nice to me? Yeah. And and Wesley just thinks he could use a friend. And he agrees, mm-hmm. like, yeah, your ways of doing things are different. But the whole point of having this exchange program is that you learn a little bit about our ways and bring it back to your command. We learn a little bit about your ways and we decide if... You know, if either either one of our ways can be improved by the other. Like, it's not – that that's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to learn these things. Just a, a small note here, which is not at all relevant to the story. Yeah. But they have this conversation kind of in the, uh, the little mini atrium to the observation lounge. Because yes. that's the door that goes in. And I don't think there's ever a conversation that's filmed there ever again. Oh, interesting. I just thought it was neat that they're in that little space in the corner of the bridge. I don't think they ever use that – for a conversation ever later. Oh, okay. So yeah. It's, I, just, it, I just thought it was a neat place to have a conversation. No one ever talks about it. It is. And Mendon kind of like asks, he kind of brings Wesley over there to have this conversation in private because he doesn't want other yeah. people to hear because he's embarrassed. Yeah. And other times no one can hear you on the bridge anyway for dramatic purposes. Yeah. But in this case, they're like, let's actually go over here and talk. <laughs> on the bridge of the paw, Cargon uh, tells Riker to go to engineering to check on the growth of the organism. And it's really just a way to get Riker out of the room so he can speak with his other Klingon officers about Riker. Yeah, yeah. Clegg, at this point, has kind of changed his mind on Riker. And he thinks that... he he He's not sure that Riker knew of any plot. He doesn't think... Yeah, he's built some trust yeah, with Riker. Yeah, and he doesn't think yeah. Riker would have come on board if he had. And Cargon kind of... He sort of thinks like, well, you know, he would if he was ordered to. And Clagg explains that Riker's people are different. They don't volunteer for death as easily as Klingons do. And then Cargon makes a comment that Clagg might be weakening. 
Yeah, and and I think this is to your point earlier about how learning and growth can be a strength, and I think that's a big theme in this episode. And Cargon is not willing to learn or change or grow or change his mind on stuff. He's very stubborn. Uh, Riker returns, and Cargon is even more suspicious now because they found out that the Enterprise is on an intercept course. And when he finds that out, that the Enterprise is now going to find them, he kind of like, he rolls his eyes back and he's like, you almost had me convinced that this was some kind of misunderstanding. But now how do you explain the fact that the Enterprise is on an intercept course with them? And he's like, why? Yeah. And Riker's like, ask them. Riker like shouts it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, ask them. There's got to be some kind of, ex- ask them. There's got to be some explanation. So Cargon, it says instead that he's going to get ready to attack the Enterprise when they are close enough. Yeah, and on the Enterprise, they can't find the Pach because it's either cloaked or or it's been destroyed. But they're still transmitting like this automatic message to explain what's going on. And Riker says on the Pach, like, they might be here to help us. And Cargon is still having none of it. And he says, serve this ship and tell me the surest method of attack against the Enterprise. And what he's basically asking Riker to do is give up Federation secrets or Starfleet secrets. And Riker refuses. And he says, like, no, I have pledged my loyalty to this ship. If we go into battle against the Enterprise, I will die with you. I like that he doesn't even say, I will help you destroy the Enterprise. He's like, that's not going to happen. We're going to be destroyed (laughs) and I'll be destroyed with you. But I'm not going to give up Starfleet security secrets. And that actually... Uh, Cargon says, like, that was almost like a test. Like, if Riker yeah. had given up those secrets, then Targon would have would have said that he was a traitor and would have killed him right there. It's a great piece of dialogue back and forth He's because Cargon yells at him and he's like, he's like, your loyalties are in conflict. And Riker's like, no, sir, they are yeah. not. <laughs> like, yelling back and forth. It's a great little exchange between them. Uh, back on the Enterprise bridge, Mendon has isolated the organism and tells Picard that they can be removed with a tunneling neutrino beam it's the best way to clean yourself off in space it's a tunneling neutrino beam <laughs> and picard <laughs> picard wants to encourage poor mendon so he's like well done yeah and then tells Worf to add that to the hailing message so now on the paw they receive the enterprise hail over again but now there's with this offer to help them and of course cargo just says i don't believe yeah, cargo's like that's what they want us to think and riker's like yes yeah. it is because it's the truth <laughs> the truth yeah so instead he tells them to prepare for attack So the Enterprise, they think that the paw is probably the area and the cloaked. uh, And so they don't know what the intent is. So they decide to go to red alert. Yes. And that makes Cargon even more suspicious because the Enterprise has raised its shield. And Riker is like, yeah, because it doesn't, because they don't know what's going on. It's not an act of aggression. They're not going to fire first. And Cargon's like, well, they're fools because we will. And like, Cargon, what do you think is going on? Why are you going to fire first if they're not going to fire on you? Like, it's... Yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah, and then Riker decides to get sneaky. And he says, don't fire until we are within 40,000 kilometers because that will cut down on the Enterprise's response time. Right, which also happens to be transporter range. Yes, what a coincidence. (laughs) So, what a coincidence. So, Cargon says... That Riker will give the order to fire. Yeah. And Riker says, first of all, he's like, first I want to say out loud that I question your judgment and your reason for forcing a confrontation that is not valid. And then Riker casually takes the checkoff device. (laughs) The transponder. (laughs) Yeah, this transponder out of his boot. And he turns it on and he does that intentionally out in the open to get Cargon's attention. And Cargon's like, I want to see that. Riker's like, yeah, okay. And just like puts it in his <laughs> yeah. hand. And then on the Enterprise, Worf picks up the transponder and he knows that it's Riker's. So Picard is like, okay, something's going on. And he tells O'Brien to basically lock on to that transponder. And as soon as they are in range, 40,000 kilometers, beam Riker directly to the bridge so that we can find out what's going on. And so at 40,000 kilometers, uh, Cargon orders them to drop the cloaking shields and prepare to fire. And then the Enterprise beams Cargon onto the Enterprise bridge. And Clag goes to attack Riker. But Riker says that he has relieved Cargon. He's acting in an irrational manner. And then Riker sits down in the captain's chair. Yeah, all smug. Like, pretty smug. Yeah. He's just like, now I've got command of the ship. And... Cargon is now standing on the bridge completely, like, in shock. <laughs> and 
he yells out loud. He's like, Riker has no water. He tricked me. And then he goes to fire at probably Picard or someone generally. It's not clear. Yeah. It's not clear. He pulls out, he tries to draw his disruptor and Worf just like shoots him and knocks him unconscious. And Data runs over and like grabs a disruptor yeah. out of like Cargon's head. Yeah. And, and Cargon is not, has not been killed. He's just like dazed. Yeah. And Riker orders the cloaking shields off. And Data's like, okay, well, the Pach has all of their armament locked and they're ready to fire on us. And Picard's just like, what is going on? Where is Riker? <laughs> yeah. And so then he he hails the Pach and says, we're here to assist. And Cargon's like, they're not going to believe you. But then on the view screen, Captain Riker of the Pach appears and yeah. he orders the <laughs> Enterprise to lower their shields and surrender. And Picard, so there's good. some nice acting by Patrick Stewart that he like gets a little a little smile on his face and then he hides it and and says all right shields down and cargon demands to be beamed back to his ship and picard says okay yeah we'll get ready to do that first we're going to repair your ship uh captain riker thanks him so maintaining all this like yeah it's really right? like riker's like yeah. yes you will clean this organism off of our hull and uh yeah it's a it's a nice piece of I think a nice a nice little piece of trickery. Cultural yeah. understanding. Yeah, a bit, yeah. 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 So Cargon is now back on the pod. He approaches Riker and is very angry. And he's like, I took your command. He's like, yeah, but you tricked me for it. What you should have done is you should have killed me. So Riker's like, well, I don't want it. So I'm going to give you your command back. And so Cargon kind of like steps onto Riker. To, 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 and Riker looks at Clagg for yeah. a second to be like, and Clegg looks at him to see what he's going to do. And Riker kind of like, instead of stepping down, he does the same thing that Clegg did to him at the beginning. He like raises his chin and kind of yeah. growls. And Cargon like punches him in the face and knocks him yeah, over the bridge. Yeah, and then says like, get him off my ship. And Clegg, yep. Clegg says to Riker, you understand Klingons well. Yeah, he goes to pick him up off the ground. Yeah, and he's like, he has this respect that Riker played this whole situation out because he has come to understand how Klingons do things on yeah. their ship. So the Enterprise fixes the Pox hull and they beam Riker back on board. So Picard meets him in the transporter room and Riker's like... Beat up. Yeah, he's got, <laughs> he's got like got a big, big shiner and, and he <laughs> says like it, it might have been one of the shortest assignments in Starfleet history... And Picard was like, actually, it was the longest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 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 P Riker says he learned quite a bit. And when Picard says, like, well, it doesn't look like you learned when to duck, Riker explains that actually he learned when not to duck. So he yeah. he didn't accidentally take that punch. He knew as soon as he growled at at Cargon that he was gonna get clocked and yeah. and that's what happened and he that that's yeah. how it works on a Klingon ship so yeah yeah Riker thanks Worf for the transponder because it definitely came in handy yeah and then he says to Worf he says you come from a brave and unique people and then he's glad that Worf is on the Enterprise yeah. so he has this like newfound even more respect now for the Klingon people yeah. which is awesome and I think it's nice I think We'll see more of this later on. I think that uh, Worf and Riker develop a really nice friendship. They do. Actually, I was thinking about that through this episode is that it's one of the first times that we see them kind of really like interact together. Yeah. Like this. Well, I mean, we've we've seen them fighting together on the holodeck and the calisthenics programs and <laughs> right. stuff too. But, you know, but kind of helping each other out on a mission. And you're right. Like they, they, they go on to have this unique relationship and it's, it's yeah. cool to see it develop. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about this? This episode? Uh, we're getting now into some of the episodes that I regularly go back and actually watch. Okay. Which I, I was excited to do this one because this is one of those episodes that even though it's it's back in some of the earlier seasons that I don't go into very often, I will watch this episode frequently. Yeah. And it's cool to do uh, the podcast on one of those episodes. Yeah. So I, I, I frequently watch this one. I think it's a really good episode. Yeah. And I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. It is a good one. Uh, it's fun. And we've got another good one coming up. Oh, next yeah. Episode. We've been talking about this one for since the beginning of the pod. Yeah. Measure of a Man Measure next a episode. Man. Looking, looking Classic. forward to doing that one. Inspired know. like a whole season of Picard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of With the First Link. 
If you liked what you heard, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcast or your podcast provider of choice. Our cover art was created by Nathan Nunn, and you can find more of his work at NathanNunn.ca. Our theme song is An Amazing Adventure by Flame Lion Studio. You can follow us on Instagram or Twitter at FirstLinkPod, or send us an email at FirstLinkPod at gmail.com to let us know your theories about this episode. I'm Matthew. And I'm Ruthie. And on your next exchange program, please do your best not to start an interstellar war. (laughs) Yeah.